thank you, Shugo and Kenko. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming and joining on this third day of spring. Um, <clears throat> uh, what, what was the inspiration and influence for my talk this, this time uh, came from a YouTube video. Uh, and I happened to see this video of um, a Zen teacher named Shohaku Okumura speaking, <clears throat> because, you know, those are the kind of videos I watch on YouTube. <clears throat> I only watch the Buddhist uh, instructional videos on YouTube. I'm joking. Um, <clears throat> but in this, in, uh, the, the video caught my attention because it was titled, uh, meditation is good for nothing. And uh, when I put it on, uh, I, and I read a little bit about Shohaku Akumura. Um, he was born in uh, Osaka in Japan, and, uh, and he now leads um, a sangha somewhere in Indiana. But in it, he's talking about, he first talks about Shikantaza, about just sitting. And uh, how Dogen said we need to throw ourselves into the practice without expecting any reward. And uh, he countered this with how we all come into practice with some sort of expectation. Um, we feel the need for some answers or a way out from a problem. So without an ex ex expectation or a goal, we wouldn't start practice. So here lies this conflict um, because the teaching uh, says that you shouldn't expect even an answer. So uh, I completely agree that expectations um, are important to begin practice. I think that, um, I think that my expectations actually fueled my practice pushed me to practice harder and more. I really felt there was something that I would gain or attain from the practice. I even think in the beginning, in the, those beginning days when I first began to practice, I even walked around with a little chip on my shoulder around my non-Buddhist friends, you know, kind of like I had, I had some kind of secret that they didn't have. So, you know, there is this, there is a very egocentric reason why we come into practice at first, expecting things. Um, and for me, I've, I've, I eventually realized uh, that it was healing that I was actually looking for. At first, I wasn't aware. But after some time peeling back layers, layer after layer, it became obvious that I was wounded and needed, needed some healing. And for some reason, for me, Zen practice really spoke, and it felt to me like that was gonna, that would be the way out for me. Um, and I do think that Zen practice can help you heal yourself. Not that the practice itself heals you, but it wipes away all the bullshit and helps you see uh, what needs your attention helps you see who you really are. So, so what has been on my mind lately is um, what happens after the healing? After all of this time and energy we put into healing oneself, what does the quality of practice look like then? Should, should we still practice? And why? And uh, that is where this meditation is good for nothing kind of caught my, caught my eye. Now, uh, this uh, idea of uh, meditation or zazen being good for nothing um, came from uh, Okumura's teacher's teacher, who was a, um, a Zen teacher named uh, Kodo Sawaki. And uh, he lived from 1880 until 1965. 
just a little bit about him because I think he led a very interesting life. Um, he was born in 1880. He was the sixth child uh, and both of his parents died when he was young. His mother when he, when he was four and his father when he was seven. He was then adopted by an aunt um, who uh, soon died after that. And after that, he was raised by a gambler and lantern maker. Uh, and I guess he was with, with this gambler and lantern maker for a number of years. And when he was 16, he ran away from home and ran to a Heiji to become a monk. Um, <clears throat> he was ordained uh, a few years later, um, but then he was drafted and had to ser serve in the Imperial Japanese Army from 1904 to 1905. He came back in 1906 and, um, and, and uh, embarked on an extensive study period uh, doing different trainings as a priest and also different trainings uh, in Buddhism. <clears throat> uh, later on, he became a Zen teacher in the 20s and, and in the 30s. And then in uh, 1949, he finally took the responsibility for a Zen temple. But because he was very well known for traveling all throughout, um, all throughout Japan, giving, uh, trying to speak the Dharma everywhere. And that he wasn't always, or very, or very seldomly was he at his home temple. So he, he ended up uh, adopting the nickname Homeless Kodo since uh, he was never home. Uh, and he is most known for his rigorous emphasis on Zazen, <coughs> in particular Shikantaza. And he often called Zen wonderfully useless and discouraged gaining I any ideas or seeking after any special experiences or states of consciousness. <clears throat> so a few little things that he wrote that I thought interesting leading up to the good for nothing. Uh, here's a few things he wrote. Uh, he wrote these uh, 17 methods, I guess, of 17, uh, 17 things to help, to help us in our lives. And here's a few of the, few of the, the steps. This is to, to you who can't stop worrying about how others see you. You can't trade even a single fart with the, guy, with the next guy. Each and every one of us has to live out his own life. Don't waste time thinking about who's most talented. The eyes don't say, sure, we're lower, but we see more. The eyebrows don't reply, sure, we don't see anything, but we are higher up. <clears throat> the nose can't replace the eyes and the mouth can't replace the ears. Everything has its own identity, which is unsurpassable in the whole universe. And uh, to you who are totally exhausted from fighting with your spouse, the question isn't who is right. You're simply seeing things from different points of view. It all begins when we say I. Everything that follows is illusion. Stop trying to be something special. Just be what you are. Hold fire. Just sit. Another little thing, a little snippet of one. To you who wish you could lead a happier life. Rest a while and everything will be fine. We simply need to take a short break. Being Buddha means taking a short break from being a human. Being Buddha does, doesn't mean working your way up as a human. <clears throat> so anyway, I, I found him to be quite a character and I, and I love his particular flavor that he brings to his words. But the most important, uh, the most uh, memorable thing that he wrote and said was, what is Zazen good for? It's good for nothing. As long as this good for nothing practice does not penetrate our bones and we really practice what is good for nothing, it won't be good for anything. In order for Zazen to be good for anything, it has to be good for nothing.
now bring this brings me back to the um, <clears throat> to the thing that Okumura said that really penetrated me, and it has to do with this good for nothing practice. And he says, deep in my heart, I think that to practice good for nothing zazen is the most authentic practice in Buddhist tradition. That's why I'm okay. That's why my life is meaningful. One day I found myself sitting alone, not as a practitioner in a sangha, or not as a Buddhist priest in a kind of social occupation. I sat by myself and I found a deep peace. That means I don't have to be a good boy. I can be just sitting. <clears throat> and I found that that is really Zazen, which is good for nothing. <clears throat> Before that, I intellectually understood that Zazen is good for nothing as a Buddhist philosophy. But I found <clears throat> that that is the ground we need to practice without the desire to be a good boy not only in the secular mundane way, but even as a Buddhist. And to me, really the words that penetrated for me was when he said, um, I don't have to be a good boy. <clears throat> that really penetrated for me. And uh, in reflecting on that and hearing that, it really reminded me of an exercise that my late piano teacher, uh, Sophia, <clears throat> uh, used to have us do. And uh, I wasn't, the first time she asked me to do this, I wasn't expecting it. And uh, so I was sitting at the piano and there was a passage that I was working on with her. And she said, uh, reach up to your right there, there's a, a blindfold. I want you to put the blindfold on. I said, okay. And, and she said, now I want you to play the music and I want you to hear the music in your, in your mind. And I want you to I want your body to follow the flow of the music. I don't want you to stop when you make a mistake. <clears throat> and she would always say that uh, Picasso would, uh, would always say that you had to make a mess before you had to make anything beautiful. So I was being encouraged to make a mess on the piano. Um, <clears throat> and the ex experience was, was very profound. Um, first of all, uh, the physical experience, because of course you're gonna make mistakes. I'm blindfolded so I can't see what I'm doing. There's gonna be times when I make a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> and what happened when I would make a mistake? I would stop, I would immediately stop, I was like halted in a, in a very jarring, tense and stiff way. It's very difficult to stay relaxed and face those mistakes. And I would stop and she'd say, no, you have to keep going. You have to stay in the flow of the music. Don't worry about the mistakes. I don't. I, I want you to make mistakes. She was almost saying, "I want you to make a mess on the piano." And it was very hard to uh, to stay relaxed and loose while I was witnessing myself make these errors, these mistakes. I was so programmed to stop and go back and fix. And of course. I'm sorry for hearing these sounds. I have to live with several cats and can't control them. Um, so, of course, what happens when you stop and you <clears throat> stop to, to, to correct your mistake is you completely leave the flow of the music. Um, I remember uh, hearing from uh, another student of Sophia's, and this was before I went to study with her, this was perhaps the one of the main reasons I, I ended up calling her. <clears throat> and this was a woman who had uh, studied at Juilliard, and spent her life in conservatories with very strict piano teachers, and would have to you know, practice eight to 10 hours a day. 
and she said she went and had her first lesson with Sophia. And at the end of the lesson, and, and Sophia lived, lived very close to the Metropolitan Museum. At the end of the lesson, she went, she said she went and sat on the steps of the museum and just wept for about a, a half an hour <clears throat> because uh, she felt the weight of everything that had been putting on her shoulders from all the conservatories and all the study that she did. She felt it all of a sudden go away. And I had a very similar feeling when, uh, when, I, uh, when I first did this blindfold experiment. And I think that I may have even cried a little bit. After I was, <clears throat> after I really was able to tell my body that I can make a mistake and that I'm just gonna listen to the music and be in the flow of the music and let my body follow it and blah, 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 whatever mess I was making on the piano. I also started to cry. And why? Because in that moment, I didn't have to be a good boy. <clears throat> I didn't need to be a good boy. I could just sit and I could just play. And this uh, exercise forces you to witness your mistakes and face them. Face your relationship with them and how you react. And so I think that uh, Zazen, in a way, can be a blindfold for us in this way. In a sense, it also forces us to see who we really are and what is really going on. I feel that we've all have experienced different levels of trauma in our life and we carry it within us. And it comes out in uh, you know, habitual ways that largely go unnoticed by us. It's the same thing like making a mistake when practicing a piece on the piano. It's just very habitual to jump back, to just like stop and jump back. And uh, more importantly, um, not how we practice this on the cushion, but how we bring it into the world. The, the blindfold in music is there to help us stay in the flow of music when the blindfold is off. Zazen is a way to help us stay in the flow of our lives when we're off the cushion. And there's this peeling back the layers, and as you peel them back and peel them back, what happens when you reach that core where there's nothing to peel back? I imagine it's like what he said in the video, great peace without needing to be a good boy. That's why I'm okay. And that's why my life is Now, I just wanted to um, kind of plug away a little bit that uh, for me, the best practice of putting on the blindfold in Zen has been <clears throat> on session on retreat. And uh, if you're not aware, I uh, just wanted to invite you that uh, next month in Almost exactly a month. Today's the 23rd. Uh, we'll be going on July 24th for our first in person retreat in uh, nearly three years. And to me, that has always been the greatest, uh, the greatest tool for me. I look, I, I always look at it <clears throat> in terms of how many minutes you sit in a day, compare that to how many minutes are in a day, and how, how that those small amount of minutes, 30 minutes, how much that affects your day. And going to the Zendo or practicing online, how many times you do that a week, how that affects your week. And I look at uh, these retreats more as a way, how, how does it affect my whole year? <clears throat> and then also bringing that, folding that into my, into my daily life. So I really encourage you, um, if you haven't heard and haven't signed up yet, to please uh, 
come and join us. Uh, a week and a half of intensified practice. Um, and so I want to leave you now with uh, one more quote from uh, this wonderful teacher whose name I forgot. <laughs> so, Soaka, Kodo Soaki. Your lack of peace of mind, sorry, you lack peace of mind because you're running after an idea of total peace of mind. That's backwards. Be attentive to your mind in each moment, no matter how unpeaceful it might seem to be. Great peace of mind is realized only in the practice within this unpeaceful mind. When dissatisfaction is finally accepted as dissatisfaction, peace of mind reigns. Thank you for listening.